<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Code 42 Live. Uh, I can't help but uh, I was getting notes from my technical director in the background to dance like nobody was watching because nobody was. Uh, and so you get to see some of my really bad dance moves here today. Uh, joining me, hopefully also dancing to talk about how to start an insider risk program or an insider risk management program are Mark Wataziak up here and uh, Clea Ostendorf uh, down here. Uh, and first things first, I wanna take just a couple minutes and Mark and Clea, if you could introduce yourselves, who you are, what your focus is at Code42 so that everybody watching can know what's up. And because Mark, you've done this before, I'm gonna throw to Clea first. So here oh, we go. Oh man, I was expecting that. Okay, sounds good. Hi everyone, Clea Ostendorf. I've been with Code42 for two years. Uh, I'm uh, on the insider risk success team. And we work with current customers or prospective customers on helping them build out insider risk programs. Um, prior to doing this at Code42, I worked for an application security company where I helped in consulting and um, program uh, and product development. Uh, and uh, looking forward to chatting with everyone. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Clea. And look at that segue. She just like turns it up. She's like, you're taking your job, Riley. Um, Mark Wataziak, for those of you that have joined in in the past, tuned in in the past, I'm, I think I'm a, I've been a staple on this, Riley. We got to get some different talent in here sometimes. Um, but I've been at Code42 for five and a half years now. Um, I lead the product research and strategy team. So we do a ton of of research around insider risk and the insider risk problem um, and work really closely with the likes of Clea and her team on how we help customers and, and prospects uh, manage this problem um, in the easiest way, most effective way, most efficient and effective way possible. Awesome. And uh, I think that uh, the way that we're going to kind of structure this is, I guess I should say who I am. I'm Riley Bruce. I'm the security community evangelist here at Code42. Uh, it's my job to ask Mark and Clea and everybody else who joins the program the questions that folks are asking in the chat across the three platforms that we're distributing this on. So across Code42.com slash live, LinkedIn Live and YouTube. If you have a question come up or a comment about what we're talking about, please go ahead and throw that into the chat platform of your choice. And I will make sure and relay that to Mark and Clea. We do have some conversations planned to talk about today because in previous sessions we've talked about okay what is this problem of insider risk and also how do you start to address that but the thing that we're going to talk about today is where does how do you even start a program um, because a lot of organizations don't actually have anything in place today. It's something that people kind of understand is a problem. Data leaving the organization due to the actions of people inside the organization. But how do we actually start to prepare that um, or to prevent that? So I'm going to start with our first question, which is a, a little bit of a softball. But why is now the time for an organization to start building an insider risk program. And Clea, because I went to you first the last time, I will go to Mark first this time. Um, and Mark, why now? Um, well, I think for organizations that have, um, have a program um, and for organizations that don't have a program, uh, Ralph on insider risk, I mean, in in one word, um, uh, ch change. Like the biggest thing is is the workforce is changing, right? How we work. Um, we were all remote the past year. Now we're going. Some of us are going back to office. Some of us are doing hybrid work. Some of us are staying remote. Um, that you know, uh, some of us haven't made the decision yet. When I'm in, in terms of how organizationally, what are we going to do? 
Um, and, you know, and this program um, is a way to help security and the business for that matter, get their arms around uh, the, the data risks that are associated with those many different ways and structures uh, of an organization, whether it's remote work, hybrid work, in the office, what have you, um, a program will help you get your arms around that, the, the risks that come with that. Yeah, and okay. I mean, just to add to so, that, so that's... Go for just, it, Leah. Just to add, to, okay, cool. Just to add to that, I mean, that's what we're living with right now, but even prior to COVID and all of us just deciding how we're going to, going to work remotely, we were working differently than we were a decade ago. I mean, how many products do you have that you're constantly connecting with, that you're sharing and you're uploading, um, that the line between what's corporate and what's personal has been completely blurred um, and, and increased as we are all working from home. So you may use your laptop to do work, but you also are probably sending emails from it and doing personal things. And so that increases the risk of accidental data leakage, of course, but it also blurs a line of who owns this data that you're working with. It's in my house, right? Is it not mine? So I think that I think the way that we're approaching protecting our data and intellectual property goes right in line with um, needing to think about a more formalized program around it. Yeah, I, I think that that's definitely true. And um, Alex, our technical director, can can vouch for the the happiness that he saw in me today to just be back in the office for the first time. Um, it has made this whole process much easier um, for being able to get this off the ground. So that's sort of the why now is we're at an inflection point to kind of what I'm hearing from both of you that's been coming for a while, but also why don't people, why hasn't this been addressed in the past? Why don't people already have a program? And Clea, since you were kind of getting to that a little bit in your answer for the first question, I'll start off with you and then we can throw to Mark after that. Um, well, I mean, the, a program has programs like this have existed for a long time in the federal space, and we're seeing a trend that more organizations, not just the large ones, are starting to build insider risk or insider threat programs. Uh, and and I think it goes to you know the points we touched on that the the threat landscape is very different than it used to be. And then if you think of more of the human element, people don't stay at their jobs for. 10, 20, 30 years anymore, most people who are working with highly portable data, so your, your tech companies, your um, manufacturing companies that are building the next electric vehicle, these people move around and use the knowledge and things that they created in their previous companies to leverage that for their next roles. So you have to start to think about how do you protect this more proactively? And that's where I think uh, insider threat and insider risk programs are coming more into play. So it has been a thing in the past for some organizations, but now it's something that these particularly innovative organizations are needing to really embrace due to, again, where we're at um, to, to throw to that. And Mark, uh, how, what would you say with regard to why hasn't it been a thing until now? Well, I think there's a, I think to what to Clea's point that, you know, you, we've, you've seen a lot of, uh, you know, from an insider threat, insider risk maturity standpoint, a lot of it coming out of the federal government and government agencies and, and some of the larger organizations having, uh, built out insider threat teams and, and obviously programs um, built around those teams. Um, but I think that, you know, depending on who you talk to, some people would argue that they they have one. <laughs> they have an insider risk program. It's called a, a data protection program or a data protection strategy, or we have a DLP technology, or we have we have this to control and manage the risks that come from the way people work. Um, but what I see people kind of reevaluating is I go back to changes in, in workforce dynamics. So uh, hybrid workforce, return to office, whatever it might be. Um, I think organizations are rethinking their 
policies, governance, and controls um, uh, around that, um, and and are reevaluating how to do data protection. How do they manage uh, employee uh, data risk? Um, what do the policies, um, data use policies, articulate? How do they enforce them? Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different things to take into consideration when building an insider risk program that um, are um, kind of a result of these dynamics in the market that are that are taking hold as we speak. So I think you know I think companies some companies would argue that they've had one. Some companies would argue that um, that are very mature and have an insider threat program. But I think for the masses. The idea or the reality that you know maybe perhaps the way we've written our policies, maybe that perhaps the way we've done data governance in the past and in, in enforcement of policies, we need to reevaluate, um, and we need to evaluate based on uh, um, assessing where we're at. Where, where is the risk? Um, where is data at risk, and how do we um, truly manage that? And um, with how our workforce is changing, so. <clears throat> I think it's a it's a it's a really good question, uh, Riley. But I think it's a it's a nuanced one. I would well, absolutely. If anybody that. has, I I was just going to say, if anybody has anything to add to that in the comments, please do that. Um, thank you for joining us for Code Forty Two Live. I'm having a conversation with Mark Wataziak and Clea Ostendorf about how to start to build an insider risk management program. And Clea, I'm sorry, I cut you off there. It sounded like you had a follow-up to what Mark was saying, which is great. <laughs> yeah, no worries. There's a little lag on my side, so I'm, I'm uh, happy to revisit. So what, what I was just uh, to, to reiterate on, on Mark's point, um, these DLP programs were very focused on stopping things from leaving, right? We all know the story. Um, with an insider risk program where you're specifically focusing on protecting your intellectual property and your data, this is shifting the story left, right? That's a total security buzzword, but we're, we're shifting things away from being reactive and trying to be proactive to think about what would make somebody take something or when, when is somebody more likely to email themselves their secret sauce or why would somebody post things on Reddit? Like what happened prior to them taking this action that we can think about and, and visit when you're building a program or how you interact with your, your um, uh, peers? How can we build this to be more proactive, shift things left, uh, and then prevent things then from ever even happening? Yeah, and I think that that leads nicely actually into our next question, um, which we've kind of talked around why now is the time, why people haven't had a program in the past, and you know some of the things that people have attempted to use to solve this problem, if somewhat indirectly. Um, However, what is the biggest pitfall or what do you two see as the biggest things to avoid when building out a new program? And I will start with Mark this time just for the sake of trying to go back and forth and not uh, have preferential treatment here for either one. Uh I got a feeling I know what Clay is going to say, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but siloed thinking. Like, don't even attempt to build out an insider risk program um, by yourself in security. Um, don't fall trap or victim to, well, this is the way we've always done it. Um, because I, I keep going, I'm going to give them I'm a broken record. Um, people don't work the same. Like employees don't operate the same. They don't do their jobs the same. Uh, the technology is different. The cor corporate cultures are shifting and they're different. It's, you know, the employee experience. And there's so many other pressures at hand that around the business and priorities around the business across the organization that if security even attempts to build an insider risk program in a silo, it's going to fail. Um, you're going to have to really understand um, you know, everything from the involvement of other stakeholders across the organization, as well as in, in, in actually defining the program and executing on the program, but also understanding um, 
uh, how security is going to define risk tolerance, right? And what they're going to base policies on and what they're going to train on and what they're going to enforce and how they're going to enforce uh, and all those sorts of things. So I think siloed thinking is probably the worst thing you can do when, when attacking this problem and, and building a program for it. Clea? Clea, go. Yeah. Well, um, you stole my thunder, Mark, so you knew that was going to happen. But to <laughs> add to that, <laughs> to add to that, uh, I, I would also recommend or think about how you want to communicate this to the organization and then think about people uh, who might not have a traditional security background to help broaden this, this message. Um, sometimes security comes in and, and they're thought of as the stick telling people, no, we can't do that. That's, you know, it's hurting something. Um, but if you are coming in that way with an insider threat program, or an insider risk program, where you're looking at, these are my peers and these are my friends and I'm going to be doing an investigation on them, there starts to be fear within the organization. So having a good partner um, business partner or corporate communications, or even just hiring somebody um, to help manage that that rollout who has trust within the organization, I think is um, certainly um, a lesson learned that, that I have seen uh, successful programs have. So leverage or don't forget to leverage the trust that is potentially inherent within an existing human being or something like that is what I'm, I'm hearing you suggest there, Clea. Um, <laughs> so use that uh, institutional knowledge and trust effectively. Um, so I guess the flip side of what not to do is what needs to exist um, for this new program to work when you're building it out. And I am going to go to Clea first this time. So Mark, you can't steal what she was going to say. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll take the softball this time. Um, first of all, you can't enforce what people don't know. So have policies on what's acceptable and as much as possible, try to be specific. So um, for example, when you leave this company, you can take the PowerPoints you created, you can take uh, all the screenshots of presentations, but you can't take the um, roadmap that you worked on with your product management team. I mean, these are kind of vague examples, but be specific enough when with, with each role um, that when they leave, they can take these things. Uh, and then and then help with that off offboarding process because people are going to leave your company. So help them with this offboarding process um, so that they can can tell you what they are taking. You can go through it. There's going to be no gray area. Um, I think this we I, we do this at Code 42 and I think it leads to trust within the organization that we're not trying to stop you from taking photos of your dog or pictures with your coworkers. But there are some things that we value as intellectual property and we an, an ownership, and we want to hold on to that. For sure. And Mark, I what what are the things that must be included uh, when you're building out a program? Oh gosh, Clea, thank you for taking my thought process. Um, now I got to think on my feet. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to touch on what she already touched on, but I love the whole start with why I'm a Simon Sinek fan. And, and it's like this whole notion of employees are owed, like why have a program, right? So our line of business partners, like why are we building an insider risk program at this company? What's the ultimate why, right? What are the implications of, of corporate data leak? Why does it matter? What data leaks really matter? Like that context is important um, for employees, for, for people managers, what for whatnot, because then, you know, employees will begin to factor risk into their decision making process. Right. Right now they don't. They they make they make decisions based on time and reward. We all do. How long is this going to take me? And how is it going to make me look in the end? Am I going to be a hero? Am I going to, you know, score well on my review? 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't, we don't factor risk in because we don't have context as to the why an insider risk management program is needed. Like, um, no, I'm not going to put this file in this place. Yes, it's an extra step for me to share this file in this way with a coworker. Um, no, I don't want to call security to see if it's okay to do this. Well, maybe you should. If you, if you understood the why, maybe you should call security and ask them or give them the heads up, right? Or double check that policy um, to make sure that you're, you're factoring risk into that, into that um, equation, that decision-making process. So I think why is an important thing to, to start with. Um, I think it's important to have that why to build the bridges across the business. So that again, I go back to don't build it in a silo, um, build it across the business and everybody has shared knowledge and context as to, to the reasons why we're building the program. Um, and then I, th I think um, I, I'm gonna play off a little bit of what Clea said in terms of must haves is outcomes. Like the why is the outcomes? How are you gonna measure this? What, is, what does success look like? Um, and, and one place you need to start is what does risk look like today? Like you, you can't just assume that you understand your level of insider risk posture or maturity. Um, you should do an assessment. You should look at where is data leaving? How is it leaving? Um, how are employees working? What are they doing with our data? Where do we have gaps in security awareness? Where do we have gaps in policy? Where do we have gaps in technology? Get a really good understanding of that so that you build a program that's rooted in reality, not rooted in you know uh, ideology or what, what you'd love to see. And then you can start building metrics behind that. Like how are you gonna measure it? Shadow IT use, departing employees taking data, whatever it might be. Um, it makes it a lot easier to focus on outcomes and, and metrics if, if you know where you're starting from. <clears throat> And that's actually a, a great thing to talk about because we actually got during your answer there, Mark, we got a question from the chat of what do some of those outcomes look like? Um, do you have examples of what, whether they're specific metrics, whether it's actually looking at uh, what would those outcomes look like? And I'll go to you first, Mark, because you're the one who brought it up. And then Clea, if you have anything to add, obviously feel free to do that. Well, look at, look, you know, one thing that you look at your current, I talked about earlier how um, data use policies are evolving, right, for hybrid work. Well, take a look at your data use policy today, right? Um, look at a component of it like um, uh, use of unsanctioned apps, right, on a daily basis. Um, I'm sure there's a policy against moving corporate data to a personal device or personal application, cloud application, email. Um, start there. Start with, okay, what does our posture look like? What percentage of employees are using unsanctioned tools today? Do we know? Um, get that answer and then say, okay, um, we are going to, and that's a, that's a ding on our risk posture, right? If they're using unsanctioned apps and tools, then that means by and large corporate data is traveling to those unsanctioned apps and tools. What percentage of employees are doing that today? Okay, in 60 days, we'd like to lower that percentage to X. In 180 days, we'd like to lower that percentage to Y, right? So then you can begin using smart metrics in security that says, oh, by December 31st, 2021, we want to decrease our employee use of unsanctioned applications from 60% of employees to 25% of employees or whatever that magic number might be. Um, you can do it at a micro level like that by use case, or you can do it at a more macro level, um, complete insider risk maturity or insider risk posture perspective, taking into account a number of different um, um, uh, parameters or variables. <clears throat> so I think I love smart metrics that are from X to Y by such a date, right? Um, but you can't, you can't do that without X. Again, you got to understand. Okay, pick pick a pick a policy that's being broken. Say, and, and how big of a risk is that? And then hone in on that one. Um, and, and and if you begin to show value and prove that your people, process, technology, your program that you've put into place is improving that number, odds are you're going to get more investment 
in building out that program. You're going to get more resources to build out that program. It's delivering business value. It's protecting the company, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> And yeah, Clea, to, do you to, have examples um, of what you'd say for outcomes? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, you like like Mark said, you can look at this two ways. You want to look at it the macro level where you're looking at the trends. How are we reducing the risk posture of in our organization? And then you want to get into specifics. Can you identify specific uh, roles that are um, violating policies? Can you determine specific departments or offices or, or who is, who, who are the guilty parties that we either need to educate? Um, not necessarily with a stick, right? Come in softly, tell them <laughs> the why behind it. I, I second that. Um, or, um, you know, what do we need to change from a policy perspective? And then again, educate our employees on why we're changing this and the risk that it poses to the business um, so that you can make some, some incremental changes. Um, uh, some, some of the things that I, I like to throw out as more tangible measurements, um, we know that you probably don't want to be uploading things unless you're in the marketing team to social media. So if you see somebody continuously is uploading something or sending things to Reddit or um, some other non-trusted sources or, or uh, locations, how can you educate and start to change the employee behavior? Um, so uh, I, I like to uh, report on specific things like that, as well as looking at the overall trends that you're reducing uh, any risk tolerance or risk uh, So uh, something that actually came in from the chat on another platform was a follow up to that question or uh, just kind of related to what y'all were both talking about. But before I get to that, I want to say welcome to everybody who's joining us live at either code42.com slash live or on LinkedIn or on YouTube. If you have questions or comments about what we're talking about today, which is how to start an insider risk management program, throw them into the chat and we will address them here. Um, so you both mentioned you need to reduce the, or kind of have differences in those metrics and change employee behavior is the, the goal here. So you, you mentioned education as being an option there, awareness, how do you increase that? Where, where would be the first thing for an organization to start once they have defined X, how do you start moving the needle toward why? Uh, and I will go to Clea first on this one. Sure. So um, baselining in regardless whether we're talking about insider risk or we're talking about um, the number of uh, phishing attempts you get in a month, you have to baseline. You have to understand where you where you're where you're at. Then um, look at what your biggest risk areas are. So. If this gets out, so um, you know you are releasing the next electric vehicle. It's a hot topic. You're competing against um, all the other car companies, and you need to uh, make sure that your prototype does not get released before uh, your competitor releases theirs. So, what is the risk to the business if this gets out? Now, start to think about what are the vectors that this could get out. Now start to think about who has access to this, this data and how would they get this out? So if you do a, a, um, a baselining exercise and then dig into some more threat modeling and actually the uh, likelihood at how it would happen, um, you can start to have a better idea of where you need to focus your efforts. Great answer. Mark, um, how do we get from X to Y, or how do we start um, in in just an example of the non-sanctioned app usage? Um, how would you start to address that? Sorry, there's a slight delay, but I think I, I think I got your question. I don't know if it's on my end or your end, but <clears throat> anyway, how would you start to address getting from X to Y? Um, <clears throat> you know. I, risk assessment would be the first um i know with you know 
you know, I'll, I'll do a little bit of, of product pitching, but with code 42, you can run a proof of value. You know, you can run, you can run uh, our agent across a subset of endpoints and understand employee behavior, right? Employee behavior, the X looks like this today. It looks like you have corporate files go to an unsanctioned app destination like Dropbox or an untrusted destination. It looks like you have, you know, a lot of thumb drive use on weekends. It looks like you, whatever it might be, you can get the X, right? You can get the X that you want to start with um, and then begin to, to define that metric. But Clea makes a fantastic point in that, and I think at the point I made earlier, the X is important, <clears throat> but um, defining the X is equally as important. Right. So here's I, mean, I talked about how employees deserve the why when it comes to making risk based decisions or factoring risk into their uh, decision making process. Um, but security is the business owns owes security the why. Right. So Clea talked about product launch as an example. Right. So tell me the last time. I don't know if this happens at your organization, but it happens at ours um, because as a, as a we're a security culture and we're a security company. But. Security knows when the next big product launch is coming, right? They're well aware of the product roadmap. They're well aware of the impact on the business that this product is going to have. Um, security is owed that from the business so that they can ask those hard questions. So they can take a good look at, okay, we know we have a product coming out in 60 days. All right. So let's look at our posture right now, because we know if it's going to leak, it's going to leak, you know, um, or say night, the next quarter, it's going to, it's going to leak 90 days in, right. Uh, at some point, that's when employees start leaking data. So <clears throat> we're most likely to leak data. So, uh, let's look at our insider risk posture pre-launch. Let's make sure we got everything buttoned up, right? So, uh, the valuable information in Clea's example is product plans, CAD drawings, whatever it might be, right? Um, uh, let's talk to the product team. What are the file formats? Who should have rights to this right now? Who's who's who are the key? Who's got privileged access? Who shouldn't have access? What destinations or or locations is 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 data relative to this product launch? Do you consider safe versus unsafe? Um, and okay, now let's take an assessment of where that is, what we look like right now, so we can shore up our defenses, so we can get visibility to data movement. Should any of our product plans move to an untrusted location? Uh, by an untrusted user or whatever it might be. Let's get ahead of the problem. To Clea's point, shift left, be proactive, um, and then that'll help you define that X. The same applies for a merger and acquisition, an initial public offering, any major company milestone. Security is owed <laughs> that milestone and being part of that process so that they can shift left and do an assessment and understand and define their X, right? So that, you know, um, so that they're not being held to the fire should something get out um, uh, and have to react to something. And, and it, it's just better off for the whole business if security is on the front end of it versus the back end. Yeah, and I think that actually goes back nicely to our, what are the must haves in building out a program um, it sounds like what you're saying is a must have is good data inputs to the security team for those milestones and also for the, the type of expected behavior of the, the employees within particular organizations. Um, and I'm going to move on now to the next question. And welcome to everybody who's joining us live at code42.com slash live or LinkedIn or YouTube. Um, the, I'm here today with Mark Watasiak and Clea Ossendorf talking about how to start an insider risk management program. And the next question that I have for the two of you is what teams should be engaged in the core team for this process? when you're building out the program. Um, and Mark, I, I know that you went second last time, so you're gonna go first this time. So you can clearly steal all of Clea's ideas uh, before she has the opportunity to say them. Uh, and then she has to make something up on the fly. So Mark. Oh, I'm, gonna keep, I'm gonna keep my answer short because 
it's all in that book. Am I pointing at my right shoulder? That book. Um, well, the ones, not all of it, the ones we highlight in the book. Um, obviously, security, IT, legal, HR. Those are the big four. Those are the big four that we, we write about in, in the book. Now, I'm sure Clea, since she's on the advisory side and she's actually sitting with customers and building programs, she's probably got uh, maybe potentially a few others to add to the list. But, you know, it, it, those are the big four that we say in terms of building out a program. They're the ones that are probably going to be most likely to be in the day to day. And, and, and quite frankly, the ones that probably have shared priorities. Right. So, for example, HR might have a priority around ensuring uh, the employee experience relative to the corporate culture. Right. They also may have a, uh, a priority around uh, retaining the top talent. Right. They might have a, they have different. Those are they're, they're people, people. Right. So there's there's HR priorities at play that have an impact on an insider risk program. Legal, the same. I mean, they're, they're going to be about um, protecting the brand reputation and they have priorities around um, protecting the integrity of the brand and the company. <clears throat> um, and then obviously security and IT, you know, security's got a ton of priorities. And IT, just from, a, from an endpoint performance perspective, from number of applications to the you know, um, to the the way technology is is provided um, to employees, what's sanctioned, unsanctioned, all that kind of stuff, um, uh, and the use cases that they have relative to um, the, the 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 tech, right, and the people. So those are my big four. I'm I'm gonna let Clea um, expose on those four, plus perhaps have more insight in who I'm not thinking about. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so yes, I definitely second all of those. Um, some of the things that we run into uh, quite often is that these teams don't necessarily trust each other. So don't expect overnight that these four groups that we just listed are going to be your best friends and give you all the information. Um, it takes time for HR to trust that security is not going to uh, use and abuse the personal information that they're giving you on an employee who might need to have a deeper investigation. Um, you know, it takes time for legal to trust the security analyst judgment that something, an event that occurred is worth a deeper investigation. So it is an iterative process, um, but setting the table that everyone has uh, skin in the game, they're bringing different perspectives um, and they're, and they're bringing, um, their expertise to make this uh, a well-rounded and appropriate program for the company is, is really key. You know, legal is going to think about um, privacy and um, regulations, GDPR, CCPA. That's big on everyone's mind. HR is going to take the more personal approach about uh, employee experience and how can we make sure that um, they they don't feel uh, like it's a big brother program. And then security needs to uh, do this in a way that is not crossing the line in any of the the previous statements. Like we need to respect employee privacy. We need to do uh, respect um, em employees' personal situations, but you also need that information to move forward uh, and be proactive in investigations. So um, a really great um uh, example that Mark gave previously was if your company is going to IPO, um, you know that it's, you know, that's coming. The whole company knows it's coming. You also know that with an IPO or with some M&A activity, uh, people are going to start to change roles or look at other places. So you are likely to see an uptick in activities. Um, so use that holistic t knowledge that everyone knows to your advantage when you're looking at customer activities. I hope that my face is not frozen like that for everyone. I think it is. <laughs> no, it's not. No, you're not we're, frozen. We're good. Um, okay, well, the, the I see, I look like <laughs> cross-eyed, so. No, you're good. Um, the I kind of related to that, and something did just come in via the, the chat on YouTube here, uh, is, where is the line or is there a rule of thumb for security teams here in 
protecting employee privacy? Um, is there, what is for organizations who maybe haven't approached this before, what can be that rule of thumb where it's like, this is where we're, we should preserve privacy versus this is where it's actionable on the part of the organization. And Clea, I'll go to you first, since you're the one that kind of brought that up. Um, and then Mark, if you want to follow up on that afterward. Sure. Um, so something that's critical, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring this up earlier, but now it's a great point, is make sure that there are rules of engagement determined and uh, documented on how investigations are done. So who the stakeholders are, what they're looking at, why they may do an investigation, what the outcomes may be, who's actually looking at the personal information of the employee. Have all of that documented and make sure that it's uniform for everyone. So executives down to your you know, brand new intern, everyone gets treated the same way. Uh, and then there's checks and balances. So there is a... Uh, your, your insider threat program manager may run one side of the investigations, but if there's any conflict of interest, say his brother works at the company as well, and there needs to be an investigation, <laughs> you ship that to somebody else. Um, you know, it's a family affair. Nepotism sometimes still happens. It's probably a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And document it. Um, and as many processes as you can automate so that there, ta again, takes out that that human element that somebody is coming after me because they don't like me or they, you know, have some vendetta against my department um, helps eliminate some of that uh, bias. Yeah. And obviously the discussion of bias is something that is probably worth its own conversation in this series that, <clears throat> that maybe we'll have in the future. Uh, but Mark, uh, where do you see the line for respecting employee privacy versus the the need to know what's going on with employees uh, on their devices. Well, I <clears throat> I don't know. I think that Code Forty Two security team does a fantastic job of, of of drawing the line and being transparent. Right. So as an employee coming into work at Code 42 five years ago and still through ongoing security awareness and 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 engagement with the security team is I go I keep going back to employees are owed the why. Right. Just as much as, as the security team is owed the why from the business employees like we monitor traffic, we monitor data movement uh, coming to and from your endpoint, you know, and this is why we do that. Right, we do that to protect you, to protect our customers, to protect our partners, to protect the company, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they're also, and, and we're very transparent about that from, from the first employee onboarding training and our experience week and, and, and what the onboarding process with, with every employee. <clears throat> but then also <clears throat> be transparent about what you're monitoring explicitly. Right. There's like Clea brought up rules of engagement and clearly defined and documented processes, um, but also clearly defined and documented um, uh, 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 trans you're transparent about what you're actually monitoring um, uh, on the endpoint coming to and from the endpoint. Um, and that level of transparency with the employee is 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 paramount. We understand what they're monitoring. Um, it's it's a it's you know, it's it's a. It's a win-win because the, the employee can feel comfortable with uh, privacy, <clears throat> that their privacy isn't being infringed upon, but also um, it's having that awareness of, of, of uh, and the reasons why we monitor data movement <clears throat> um, is one heck of a deterrent to making risky decisions. Um, again, factoring risk into your decision-making process. I keep going back to that one too, I'm like a broken record. Uh, you know, I might save an hour, I might save five minutes by cutting the corners and sharing this file, but I remember, oh yeah, they monitor for activity like that because it's risky. It poses risk to our customers, our customers' data, our data, um, our coworkers' data. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cut that 10 minute corner. Um, I'm just going to do it right and, and use um, what I'm intending to use. That's fantastic deterrent. 
um, that wouldn't exist if the security team wasn't transparent with me out of the gate that, hey, we monitor this and this is why we <laughs> monitor it. And I'm like, okay, I get you. Um, I don't feel infringed upon. Um, I'll follow the rules. Yeah, and I think that that leads nicely into the the final sort of prepared question that that we had for this session um and here's also i just want to say welcome to everybody who maybe is just tuning in now to code 42 live we're talking about how to start an insider risk management program with mark Wataziak and clea ostendorf uh leave any questions that you have in the comments and we'll get to that straight away but the the final prepared question here is how do you communicate the creation of this employee uh, of this program with employees and that could be even uh, what format does that communication need to go through who does the communication um that kind of thing and mark i will go to you first so you get to steal the ideas uh this time Am I frozen? No, I guess I'm not frozen. How do you communicate nope, with employees? Okay, early and often um, in many formats. Um, this isn't a check the box type of thing. This is early, often, all the time. Um, we're building this program. This is what, you know, I go back to from security should be part of the onboarding process, right? The welcoming of a new employee, right? Security should be part of them. Everyone has security awareness and training, not everybody, but most companies have security awareness and training programs. Um, but, um, you know, they've, they've got to be continuous, right? They've got to be contextual too, um, based on how an employee is creating risk um, for the, for the organization. So I think it's early and often. Um, I think you're I, I'm going to go back to transparency, be transparent about why, why we have a program, what we're monitoring for, why we're doing it um, and, and do that early. And then as employees, you know, as you're monitoring, you're going to see things. So there's going to be opportunities, you know, teachable moments to say, Hey, FYI, <laughs> A little nudge. Remember, we don't. This is this is posing risk um, to the organization, and and just nudge the employee in any way, shape, or form. Could be a video, could be an email, could be a Slack message. Oh my gosh, it could be a phone call. Um, if anyone would pick up their cell phones. Um, hey, just wanted to check with you. You've got a public file share out on Google. Did you intend that to be public? I get those calls. I'm like, oh no, I didn't. Or those Slack messages. I didn't. Let me fix that right away. Um, sorry about that. No, all good. Um, oh, did you know that your laptop, your Apple is syncing to iCloud, your personal iCloud? No, I had no idea. I just got my new Mac and put in my Apple ID and and it just started doing that. Yeah, let's, here's how you turn that off. Um, and um, we can walk you through that, right? So early and often I and mean, this isn't there's no check the box with this stuff that's the problem there's no magic tech there's no magic process there's no magic training um it's a continual you know managing insider risk is a is a commitment um a human commitment and 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 as much as a technology and process commitment <laughs> So uh, to, to add to that, I, I mean, the, the threat of Big Brother and uh, overly um, invasive pro tools that are looking at all of our information and what is that going to do to our company culture? I basically hear that with every single customer I work with. Um, and Mark has said this many times, but you have to explain the why behind it. Why, why are we starting this program or why are we formalizing it? How does it affect our business? How does it affect your, your options as a, a shareholder in our company? What does it mean for our future? Here's why we wanna do this. Here's how we're going to do this. Uh, here's who's going to be involved. This is what they're going to look at. Uh, and this is what something, an investigation might look like. It's also a really great time to reiterate what's acceptable and what it's not. A reminder, this is a business laptop. So please do not put photos that you do not want somebody to see. Keep that in mind. I mean, yes, there is that blurred line of, of um, 
personal and corporate use on pretty much everyone's laptops, but also know that somebody could always look at that. Uh, and I think just personally, and I see this with, with other people as well, it's that thought that a camera is watching you makes you probably put the cart back, right? Or makes you take that extra step to, to do things right um, and keep communicating that. Yeah. And I think that that is an excellent way to sort of wrap up here today. The, the last question, and this is something that uh, is sort of the, the lightning round, more lighthearted, uh, goofy human tricks type of thing, uh, is what's the riskiest thing that you've ever done or heard of someone doing with corporate data uh and really quick so that mark can come up with a different one from the last time i asked him this question clea uh <laughs> what is your favorite story of risky data behavior uh that can be completely anonymized it doesn't have to be about you uh that you've heard mm, okay well this is a public one so i'll talk about it but it's one of my favorite uh use cases there is a security company in the Bay Area, pick your poison, they're public, and a security admin uh, was able to access the earnings reports. And he did this for years, and he shared them with all his buddies, and they traded on that information, and they made a lot of money, and then they finally got busted um, while he was boarding a plane to a foreign country. So, you know, these things are real, they happen. Um, I think that's just like the ultimate, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody was doing that. And then they got away with it for so many years. Crazy. All right. That's a great answer. Mark, uh, what what have you got for me? I have to come up with a new one. I'm gonna, I don't even remember what example I've used in the past or story I've used in the past. So I'm going to just go with what still scares me. I don't even know if this still <laughs> happens, but this happened in one of my... I remember, and sometimes I think about this. Um, I'm, well, I, I not sometimes. I only think about this when Riley asks me this question. Um, when, and I'll, I, I remember when I, when previous employer, or previous job, um, and think about that if this still happens today. <clears throat> but this was risky back then, um, and it wasn't too long ago. Um, employees were responsible for backing up their laptops. Right. Um, there was no centralized like enterprise backup provider, right? That was used. So um, every employee was given an external hard drive, or they could expense one to literally plug into their laptop and copy all of the files to it and take it with them wherever they go. Take it. And it was encouraged to take it off site for disaster recovery purposes. Like, could you, that is like a gigantic <laughs> corporate risk. And, um, and if it's still happening today, that's still, that scares me, right? Um, large or small company, it doesn't matter. Like if you're, if your policy is, Hey, we've issued a corporate laptop. Um, we don't really have a, a backup policy, but it's up to you to protect your data on your laptop. So here's a go at expense and external hard drive. And, and by the way, keep it off site so that, you know, in case of disaster, we don't lose that data. Okay, um, sure. Um, please, I hope anyone listening that that's not your current policy, um, go to a cloud-based backup or move everything to the cloud um, at some point, which I, a lot of companies are doing. So I assume that that's not happening as much as it used to. But think about that. Think about that's that insider risk. Are, it's nuts. It's it's nuts. <laughs> Both of those are absolutely excellent um, things not to do. So uh, thank you both very much for your time today. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined us. Uh, please tune back in in two weeks. We'll be having another conversation about insider risk that I'm really excited about, but I don't yet want to say the topic for. Uh, but tune in next time at code42.com slash live or YouTube or LinkedIn. Thank you, Mark and Clea, and have a great day, everybody.
Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Cleo.